Thank you, Amanda. Um, I'm thrilled to have Senator Murkowski here and Dr. Zink to talk about the COVID-19 crisis and the response in the state of Alaska. Welcome, Senator, and welcome, Dr. Zink. Thank you. Good to be with you, Amanda. Um, I wanted to start off with just a, a statistic that really struck me when I was preparing for this conversation, and that is that um, Alaska has the highest per capita vaccination rate of any state in the country as of late last week. Um, I was looking at the Bloomberg tracker and it said that 37 doses have been given out for every 100 people. Um, and I know Dr. Zink has some additional uh, detail about that. So I wanted to hear about that from her and then just have you both talk about how the state has managed this given you know it's so vast and so rural, um, you know, kind of what were the factors that went into creating a situation where we're seeing these uh, great statistics coming out of Alaska? So yeah, we're really excited to have vaccine uh, in the state of Alaska, kind of like the sun. We had a little bit at first uh, and now it is coming in quickly and we are really excited to be on the offense, getting sun in, getting vaccine in and uh, being able to move forward. Uh, we have some communities where over 50% of the community is fully vaccinated who are eligible. We have over 63% of our seniors have started their vaccine journey and we expect to really be moving uh, quite quickly uh, this next month. Alaska is huge. It's bigger than California, Texas, and Montana combined. Uh, you take us and spread us across the United States and we essentially go coast to coast. And the reason we've been able to get vaccine out uh, to every part of the state as quickly as possible is because uh, of the three major reasons. One has been public health infrastructure. Uh, we have a pretty centralized public health infrastructure that has all of these different branches. And we work very closely with the tribes and public health is tribal health in this state. They are incredibly intertwined. We have over 50% of our testing sites are at tribal health sites. And so we built our entire vaccine team in partnership with our tribal team at every single level from communication to planning to operation. Uh, they have been at the table with us and planning. We've also been in the process for redistribution of vaccine for years. Uh, we can't get vaccine to all of our communities without redistributing. And so we really built on that existing infrastructure. And it's just re-emphasized to me the importance of investment in public health so that we can be able to respond quickly and importance with partnerships. So really partnering again with the tribes, but then also the local communities. Again, again, this pandemic, when communities have the tools that they need to protect themselves and to respond, they get it done in all sorts of creative ways. And so the partnerships with our communities have just been awe-inspiring uh, to see uh, their response and being able to do everything from home to home, to boat up, uh, to dog sled, to snow machine, to plane uh, vaccine uh, allocation and uh, distrib distribution around the state. And then the last big thing has just been creativity and along those partnerships. So we asked for monthly allocation that has allowed us to overcome some of our geographic uh, barriers. Uh, and we also know that we have other vaccine coming in uh, for, our, for IHS distribution. We have 229 sovereign tribes in our state and working with them is critical and they have a vaccine uh, distribution. So again, working with that partnership. But then we're also lucky to have the highest per capita veterans uh, population. And so working with the VA, the DOD, the federal pharmacy partnerships uh, and getting vaccine out uh, in those ways has helped to get our vaccine out quickly and get a lot of people protected. We're really all in this together. Well, you know, Dr. Zink um, speaks about the creativity. And before I, before I tell a little story there, I just want to give a very, very big shout out to her and her leadership throughout uh, this, this COVID pandemic. Um, she has led a, a, a team that is, is pretty exceptional, but I think it has been um, an energy that, that comes from her that has allowed us to really be able to, to tell a pretty strong story about how in a geographically um, a challenged way when you've got such large large uh, geography and small population, how you do it. There was actually a, a story, I was looking to see when it came out, it was, it was mid-January and Good Morning America did a little bit of an interview about what was going on in Alaska and how we were getting the, the vaccine distributed. And uh, it, it, it tells the story of one pharmacist, one medical doctor and two nurses who travel in and in one day by plane, sled, and snowmobile to deliver the vaccine to people. Um, they, they kind of talk about the story of how in order to keep the vaccine at the right temperature, it's, it's wrapped in, in kind of a bubble wrap protective envelope, but then literally placed under somebody's arm inside, the, inside your parka as you are on the sled being hauled by the snow machine, um, going from the airstrip 
to into town to vaccinate one elder in her home. So the length and the extent to which Alaskans kind of came together to say, we've got to get this vaccine out, this life-saving vaccine. There are far too many, far too many, particularly in our small um, uh, native villages that remember the, the devastating impact from the, the 1918 uh, Spanish influence and how it literally wiped out whole, whole villages. So getting this out and getting it to, uh, to uh, the people in these very remote areas has been a challenge, um, uh, but whether it is, it's, it's literally by small plane, uh, snow machine uh, or, or boat, um, the, the men and women that have been working to deliver these vaccines have been viewed as, as the heroes. And, and I think we're seeing, again, good results in our state uh, right now. This just seems like a massive amount and an impressive amount of coordination uh, that other states could potentially learn from. I was wondering, why do you think that Alaskans have been able to do this? Is it because in the past, being as rural and as removed as you are from the rest of the states, you've already had to do this sort of coordination, for example, for just the seasonal flu vaccine or something like that. Um, you know, how were you able to mobilize so quickly with this amount of, and this level of coordination? I'll let Dr. Zink, Zink speak to, you know, whether it's that, that uh, public health architecture um, infrastructure that we have that has really helped. But I, I think the first point to, to your question is, we've always been challenged by our geography. We've always been challenged by the elements. We've always been challenged by the fact that uh, it's small population, high cost. So we've had to figure stuff out. We've just had to figure stuff out. And, and, and so how we do it may be very unconventional. Um, it might not be delivered in a manner that, that, uh, uh, that the CDC would say in their, their guidebooks is the approved way to do it. But you can't, you can't let that hold you back. You've got to figure out how are we going to make this happen? Um, you have weather delays, you have challenges that you just have to accept. And so you have a lot of planning, you have a lot of contingency, and that's how we work as a general rule. And I think you've seen that play out uh, with, with how uh, the distribution has worked around uh, the, the, the states. People have had to be nimble um, and act quickly. And I think you're saying that. Yeah, I would totally echo what the senator is saying. I remember early on with testing, you know, we could not get any swabs uh, because people were really being allocated swabs based on how many cases they had. Well, we just don't have a lot of people. <laughs> we didn't have a lot of cases. And so we started to manufacture our own swabs really early on in the pandemic. And we didn't have any commercial labs. So we built up our state public health lab that really did the majority of the testing for multiple months um, because we just could not get testing uh, in other areas. And that really allowed us to weather some of the first initial challenges when testing was so limited. And I think that really comes from as a Senator's point of like, okay, we know no one's gonna come for us. So what can we do ourselves to figure this out and how can we build it? I think the other thing besides the public health infrastructure is to kind of build on what the Senator talked about about the 1918 pandemic. Um, that has been a part of every single conversation I've been a part of uh, in, in this pandemic response. I remember really early on, you know, we have this huge migratory population that comes up to fish in the summer. Um, and there was a lot of concern about what that looked like last summer when people were coming in to really incredibly remote and rural areas uh, and fishing, living in very densely congregate settings uh, in, very, um, in communities with very little healthcare and, and what that was gonna look like for COVID. And I remember Chief Tilden told me the story about his family essentially going to the woods for an entire year during the 1918 pandemic and said, we'll come back in a year and see what that looks like and came back and their entire community had been devastated with just immense death. Um, languages were lost, culture was lost. Uh, that has affected um, our Alaska Native people for a hundred years uh, since then, that, that this story looms large. In fact, in his region, the hospital is built in the orphanage that came about because of the 1918 pandemic. Um, and I think that that story hasn't been forgotten. And I think in a larger cultural context in the US, we have forgotten about the 1918 pandemic, but we are really susceptible uh, to viruses and bacteria. And we've lived in this golden age uh, of antibiotics and vaccines and antivirals. And we have forgotten uh, how susceptible we really truly can be. And so that oral history uh, from Alaska Native people has driven a lot of our response, uh, remembering that, remembering what worked, what didn't work and being able to respond uh, moving forward. 
And then as mentioned, you know, that infrastructure uh, that has been set up, we talked about the redistribution Many times I have no idea how they actually got it out. In fact, the story that the senator shared, I found out about on a Facebook group of physicians where she just posted, I wanted to share what an amazing day today was for me. Uh, and all the other group was like, wow, it's really cool. Tell us more. And I asked her if I could share it on social media and then it took off from there. Um, and so it's just, you know, that's been happening in all sorts of venues all across the state uh, every single day. And it's just Alaskans figuring it out uh, with the tools and resources they have. So we're just really grateful that we have a vaccine that we can distribute and people are figuring it out uh, in all sorts of super creative, um, compassionate ways that are that are appropriate to the community um, because there we need to continue to build up vaccine confidence and that's going to come from different trusted messengers in different areas for different reasons and I think when we really rely on open honest communication two-way conversation and trusting data and science it really helps we've been having community conversations with Alaskans through the beginning since the very beginning of this pandemic we've had over 400 zoom meetings where we you know share a public science echo that happens every Wednesday and people can ask any question they want with our whole team and we really just want to encourage that two-way communication. So I think that's the other thing that has really helped. We built a structure of communication and transparency since the beginning. And so it just was able to pivot when it came to vaccines. You both brought up the Alaskan native population in the state. It's my understanding that it approaches about one fifth of all the people living in Alaska, Alaska, the Alaskan native population. Now we have seen Native American communities in other areas of the country that were really hit disproportionately hard during this pandemic for a variety of reasons that range up from, um, you know, not having healthcare available on tribal lands to the same extent it is elsewhere in a state, um, not having, uh, you know, mailing addresses to get information to them. Um, have you seen a disproportionate impact on the Alaska Native communities in Alaska, or um, have some of these steps helped to mitigate that as the pandemic has gone on? We have seen a disproportionate burden of both cases, hospitalizations, and deaths. We really surged mid-November, and that's really where we saw um, it, it, it really started to rear its head. Early on, we didn't, um, and now we are starting to see really our Alaska Native people, the cases are coming down faster than other races and ethnicities in our, in our state overall, and I think because of the high vaccine uptake amongst our Alaska Native population. Once it got settled in some of our really remote rural regions, particularly like the YK Delta, it became very hard uh, to slow, slow the spread. You know, multi-generational houses. We have a lot of communities like in that region particularly that don't have running water and sewer uh, in their community. And we have seen again and again with other respiratory illnesses, higher rates of disease, higher rates of disease burden. Uh, we have a big TB outbreak going on right now. We have five times the TB uh, in the state compared to nationwide. So we continue to, we did see disparities uh, there um, and I think it's multifactorial, um, but unfortunately we're starting to see that trend reverse uh, in the setting of vaccine. I think in, in order to to compensate, as, as Dr. Zink has said, you have, you have overcrowding, um, you have uh, many, many villages, far too many villages that lack basic water and, and, and sanitation. So if the, if, the, if the health advisory is wash your hands, keep yourself clean, and, and you don't have the water to do that, to provide for your family and to keep them clean, it's pretty tough um, when you are in, in a, in, a, in a three bedroom house and you have 15 people that are living in that sharing um, uh, sharing all the sleeping spaces, there is no way for that physical separation. And so um, knowing how susceptible and how vulnerable and what the history uh, uh, had, had showed previously um, with, the, with the 1912 influenza, uh, the effort within these, within these rural communities to completely close themselves off. Now remember, these are in areas, as Dr. Zink says, particularly in the Southwest area, you have small, small village communities that are not accessible by road. Uh, you have to fly in by a small airplane or during the winter time, you might be able to take snow machine or, or dog sled in the summer, you might be able to, to go up by river boat, but it, you, it, there's not a, a, a road to the neighboring village. And so when you, you could say, well, you really do, you just kind of are, are isolated and you just hunker down on your own. But think about the very specific example of the community of Tuluksak. About a month ago, Tuluksak, had a fire in their, in their uh, washateria, which is basically the bathhouse where you wash your clothes, you wash your, 
your bodies um, and it's part of the water treatment center. Well, all of a sudden, the community of Tuluksek had no water. It's the, the river is frozen and the river has high levels of naturally occurring minerals, including arsenic. So they can't, they can't just go take the ice from the river. They couldn't go to the neighboring village, which was 20 miles away by snow machine and try to bring water back because not only their village was in self-imposed isolation, but the next village over was. And so think about what that means from a health safety perspective where you want to try to keep the virus out. And so you will do, you will, you will say no to outside assistance. You will say there, there's, there were some villages that didn't even want the mail plane to come in and land and deliver the mail because they were fearful that the, somebody would have been exposed and bring it into the village. So extreme measures were taken into, into place early on to keep these communities safe. And they did, in many of them, they escaped, they escaped the transmission of the virus, but other, other things then have presented themselves. Think about what happens when you are locked in your home in a long, cold Alaskan uh, winter. There's no, there's no school, there's no nothing outside. We, we are seeing um, disturbing, concerning, uh, matters related to domestic, domestic violence, child sexual assault, um, substance abuse, as, 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 as people have felt um, just trapped in, in their own homes. So these are, these are some of the issues that as we think about getting on the other side of COVID and what that means, uh, we're gonna be dealing with, with some of this, whether it's again, substance abuse, um, the issues of domestic violence. Uh, we've seen um, uh, higher rates uh, of suicide. Um, these, are, these are yet follow-ons to, to um, the devastation that we've already seen with COVID. I'm glad you brought that up, Senator. It's something I wanted to ask about um, just because you have such a track record of passing legislation, champion legislation that helps protect Alaskan Native women um, and Native American women elsewhere. Um, you gave a floor speech last year ahead of um, some legislation that you worked on where you noted that Alaskan Native women are two, two and a half times more likely to be victims of domestic violence. Um, you know, they're, they're disproportionately um, victims of sex trafficking. Uh, their experience of sexual violence is a lot higher. Um, we have seen that this pandemic has exacerbated domestic violence everywhere, not just in the United States, but in, in countries elsewhere as well in Europe. Um, and I was wondering what you've seen on that front in Alaska, if you're tracking it in some way, um, and if you think there are going to be lingering effects, if that's something that we're going to be continuing to deal with going forward as we emerge from the actual medical crisis, um, if, if that might be kind of one of the lingering effects that the state is dealing with. I do believe it will be. I, I, I believe that we are seeing that now, as I mentioned, whether it is whether it's suicide, substance abuse, domestic violence, child sexual assault, we're seeing that reflected in, in the numbers. Uh, I, I maintain pretty close contact with our domestic violence advocates and they're sharing um, what they are experiencing in, in terms of increased numbers and the severity of the domestic violence and the interpersonal violence that they are seeing um, throughout this pandemic. Um, uh, this past summer, we saw five village residents who lived in, 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 in rural Alaska communities die in domestic violence murders in a 10 day period. Um, you know, obviously that's the extreme, but it is, it's greatly concerning. Uh, the, the Children's Hospital in Anchorage uh, tells us that they've seen an increase in severe child abuse cases um, since the pandemic. And you, you, you couple this with the fact that um, throughout this pandemic, uh, those who, who operate our, our shelters, our safe houses, um, the places where these women and their families might go to seek safety, well, the shelters themselves also need to protect themselves from, from uh, the, the coronavirus. And so they have had to reduce their capacity in order to prevent uh, the spread. They've got to, to not have the, uh, the numbers, um, and yet the numbers 
have, have increased dramatically. And so you, you have that pressure, you have uh, a reality that we don't have sufficient um, individuals within our shelters. Um, because of, of issues with exposure, you have to have two shifts literally so that one shift can be, uh, can be in quarantine if necessary because uh, uh, somebody has come into the shelter that has tested positive. So we're, we, are, we are looking critically at what, uh, how this is impacting um, Alaska, but also more broadly, this is not just an Alaska specific issue. We know that for a fact. So this is something that I've been working with Senator Shaheen um, from New Hampshire on trying to, uh, trying to ensure that we see um, uh, COVID relief funding that is, is directed towards domestic violence survivors, um, uh, child, uh, uh, child abuse, sexual violence, um, but I, I am concerned that we will see this linger. And, 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 and it may be that we will actually see it grow in the aftermath of, of uh, COVID when we feel like, okay, we're, we're at a good place with vaccines, but, but some of what has been repressed throughout all of this, as we have been isolated, as we have been in a hunker down mode, um, as children have not been in school, I think I am, I am worried about what we will see going forward um, and the, the, the trauma that many will have, uh, will, will, will carry with them long after COVID is gone. Dr. Zink, from a public health standpoint, how do you start to address something like this, like an uptick in domestic violence and violence against children? Um, and you know, how, are there systems you can put into place if you know if you get federal funds? Like, what sorts of pro programs can be put into place and infrastructure to, you know, help deal with some of this? Yeah, sometimes I joke that I'm not the chief medical officer of COVID. You know, I'm I'm over public health, and uh, there's a lot more to public health than COVID. And all of these things go together. I also sometimes joke that you know the only way that the mind and body are separate is how we pay for healthcare, not in how we actually deliver it, and they're completely intertwined. And so when we don't have running water, people can't wash their hands. If people are isolated, I, I mean, social connection is as important to us as taking a breath and you can only hold it for so long. And so these things are fundamental to our mental well-being and our physical well-being, be it a you know, long-term care facility, a, a community. Um, and I think that there are ways to address it. For Alaska, it's critical that we're able to braid funds together uh, and that we're able to make it community specific. Um, that is just really, it's really hard to get a sense of what Unalaska looks like if you haven't been in Unalaska. And so uh, if you don't, uh, it's hard to make these federal funds uh, specifically to each one. So flexibility is key so that we can braid different funds together so that we're not just treating one part of each person, but we're treating the whole person and we're treating the whole community uh, to benefit health and wellness. We are looking a lot at the COVID funds currently coming in for testing and for vaccination as essentially seed money on how do we build healthier communities overall. And so if you're gonna to go to a homeless shelter uh, to help vaccinate, how are you making that a regular process to help build up that homeless shelter? What are you doing for those domestic violence shelters uh, to be able to make sure that they've got the staffing that they need, not only to vaccinate, but to make sure that they you know, have the staffing that they need for having those rotations. We have run our data in the state. You know, We were fortunate that last year we did not see an uptake in suicides or homicides, but we saw a significant increase in our call lines overall. And I think that it's, again, finding ways to braid that information together, braid a, together the funding and treating the whole person and not having people work for systems, but systems work for people. And I think we just need to remember that at the end of the day, these are people behind all of these funds, all of these programs, and what way do we make it work for that individual um, and that it looks really different. And as states, we need a consistent funding in public health, and we also need flexibility to have braided funding so that we can address the whole person. I would like to talk next about something um, ev everyone from coast to coast is talking about right now, and that is schools and reopening schools. And I took a look at the Alaska Smart Start 2020 plan, um, which for our viewers is kind of their roadmap for schools in different areas that lays out different criteria and metrics that they can use to decide when it's safe and to what extent and how they should approach education. Um, how is that framework working out? What is the overall situation of schools in the, in the state right now? Um, does it really depend on what area, whether it's more urban or rural? Um, and when do you expect kids to, I guess, be back in school across the board? 
It looks very different across our state. So it's really up to the school boards if they're in person or not. Uh, one of our school districts for a while was the largest school district on the West Coast to be in session. Uh, and they've been really in session through most of the pandemic. Uh, other areas have been out uh, for most of the pandemic uh, and has had a real impact. The Smart Start was started, it was really last year when we were talking about, we need to make sure that education is the constant, COVID is the variable. And so what way do we make sure that education is happening consistently, regardless of kind of case rate and what moves forward? Um, you know, we're definitely looking at changing it moving forward. I think that we have all learned a lot about respiratory illnesses, just how amazingly, honestly, masks can work, the importance of ventilation. Ventilation can be really expensive in Alaska in the winter uh, if you're trying to increase that. So a lot of our rural schools really just don't have the infrastructure to support that or the space to do that. Uh, and so kids are all really kind of in small, tight areas. So what other ways we can kind of minimize the risk? We've really tried to use geography to our advantage um, and slowing the spread. We saw when the U.S. would surge, then Alaska would surge a couple of weeks later. And when our urban areas surge, it'd be a couple of weeks later that a lot of our rural areas would start to pick up on cases. And it really highlighted how interconnected we were, but how at each level we could start to slow down. Uh, I also think that schools are public health in most of the communities. Many people know who their principal is. They know who the school board is. They have no idea who the public health person is, and that's fine. And so they are the communicators on what is public health. They teach our kids to wash their hands. They teach our kids about drugs. They teach our kids about how to stay healthy. They teach parents about that. Um, and so they're really a, a powerful tool from everything from smoking sensation to weight loss, to exercise, to COVID mitigation. And I think uh, in general, our health teams and our school teams need to be much more integrated in the future. So that again, we're really all trying to make our communities healthy and well because they are the leaders in so many of our communities uh, moving forward. And in fact, some of our rural communities their smart start guidelines was then used by the fishing industry to decide how they were gonna do testing. They were the ones who were the most involved and knew the most about what was happening in their community. That then they were kind of this, you know, base point for everyone else in that region on what they should do for COVID mitigation. So that connection to schools here has been huge, but Senator, I know you spend a lot of time on this too. Well, and I appreciate the fact, uh, Dr. Zink, that you, you started off by talking about the geography. I think it's important to remind people that um, you, you overlay the state of Alaska on top of the lower 48 and, and we'll stretch from Florida all, all the way up to California and, and go from the Gulf of Mexico practically up to the Canadian border. Now, and granted, it's, it's not one solid mass, but, but you have to put this into perspective because you would never suggest that a, a school in, in Florida, for instance, that is in an area where uh, they didn't have uh, much in terms of outbreak, uh, and a, a school in, in California need to be on the same school opening schedule. Nobody would suggest that. And so I think it is important to recognize that, that the way the state of Alaska advanced this was recognized that within the respective school districts, they, they worked very well, and I think they worked hard to understand the, the situation on the ground within their region, they're using the best available information. I mean, truly information that was, was, was made available not only daily, but, but, but uh, even, even more so. And so really allowing for that to be um, fashioned in, in, a, in a regional way that made sense. It was not without bumps. We all recognize that. I think we all, we all want to see our kids return to school, but we all wanna see our kids return to school in a safe way. And so I know there is just so much focus right now on uh, we have to get the kids back into school. We have to make sure that kids' education continues. Right, that should be that should be priority number one, and so in cer certain areas it has been more challenging to get the kids back into the classroom. So if they're still able to get that virtual learning, that's important. That's good. But taking you back to to Alaska 101 and some of the challenges that we face, we might have access to internet out in out in on Alaska Dutch Harbor area, but not enough. To not enough to, to, to sustain every kid who needs to be online, not enough to sustain uh, the, the, the individuals that are trying to, uh, to do their work remotely. And so you don't, you don't have the ability to provide for the education in some of these areas. Or if you, if you do have the internet, uh, you know, one of the stories from, from just a couple of days ago is 
uh, family up in Utyavik, which is Barrow, top of the state uh, uh, of, of Alaska there. Um, their internet bill for the month, just to support a couple kids that are online and, and a parent who's teleworking, $800 a month for your internet only. That's just, that's just one of your bills there. And so it's not, it's not practical, it's not doable. It, it leaves our kids in a situation where they're not only not in school, but they're not able to get learning in another, in another way, in another capacity. So as we think about those, those, um, those bright lights that COVID has really shown uh, on whether it's our public health uh, infrastructure, uh, one thing that we recognize is key to that infrastructure is, is, is broadband and the capacity to, to be linked in, whether it is through telehealth or distance learning with education, um, that level of equity is so important for us going forward. So I, I, I think we all wanna get kids back in school because again, to Dr. Zink's point about, about the social interaction, it's key, it's key to us as adults. It's absolutely critical for, for kids, for young children. And so uh, knowing, knowing how important that is just to the human spirit in addition to what we're doing to try to, to grow these young minds. Um, we know we, we want to get the kids in, but we know we must keep not only the kids uh, safe, but, but their, their teachers, the administrators, the support staff. So we're making some good headway, but uh, going back to the whole point of this conversation, the more the more that we can get vaccinated, the more that we can have this level of certainty, the healthier it's gonna be for our kids. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Zink, Senator Murkowski. Uh, I, we were thrilled to have you join us for this conversation today. So we really appreciate it. And uh, Senator, I look forward to seeing you back on the Hill once I get my own vaccine. So um, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank, thank you, so you Dr. Zink.